Yeah, she does American and Doctor. Yeah. So sorry, it should be how many speak talks over? Hmm? Six speak series lectures over. Fifth. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Samvad lecture series being hosted by the Sri Chatra Institute for Medical Science and Technology. This is the fifth lecture in this series of uh, very eminent people from the science, medicine, and other areas of life, walks of life who are kind of enriching us with what they know and what they have experienced. Today, we have a very eminent speaker from Mang Mangalore. Dr. Veena Vaswani. Uh, I would like to invite Professor Roy Joseph, the Dean of the Institute, to, to uh, introduce the Samvad series to this audience. Over to you, sir. Uh, good evening and um, welcome to the Samvad, which is an international lecture series hosted by Sri Chitra Tirna Institute for Medical Sciences and Technology, Dr. Van Drum. Some of these men to bring stalwarts from various fields of human endeavor to deliver talks to young researchers. Today's talk is the fifth in the series that initiated on 24th June 2022. Our first speaker was Professor Sunil Pandya, who is an eminent neurosurgeon and former editor of the Indian Journal of Medical Ethics. Other speakers were Dr. R. Chidambaram, former principal scientific advisor to Government of India, Dr. Richard A. Kyash, Mahidol Award winner for being part of the research group that developed the oral rehydration therapy. Our fourth speaker was Dr. Rohini Godboli, physicist and uh, honorable professor from the Center of High Energy Physics at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Today, we have with us Dr. Veena Vaswani, a lady who took an extraordinary career pathway in her life. Madam, thank you for taking time to join us. I request Dr. Ishwar to formally introduce our guest and honorable speaker of the day, Dr. Vaswani, to the audience. Thank you. Uh, I have a very pleasant task at my hand today. Uh, I am happy to introduce Dr. Veena Vaswani, a very rare person, a very rare species, because she's a professor in forensic medicine and toxicology and is a director Center for Ethics from the Enapoya University at Mangalore. She is a trained bioethicist and Erasmus Mundus scholar who has completed a PhD in Ethics of Forensic Medicine in Disasters from Dublin University in Ireland. She is the principal investigator for Enapoya University Fogarty International Research Ethics Master's Program for India since 2017. This is the first master's program in research ethics in India. She has been appointed as a member of the Board of Directors of International Academy of Bioethics by International Association of Bioethics in 2022. Quite a huge accomplishment for a woman from India. Uh, Dr. Veena Vaswani is a pioneer in her field, one of the very few who ventured into the bad, bad world of forensic medicine at a time when most women would have shunned that or pursued more greener pastures. By venturing into this field, she becomes an example for all women who tread the uncharted waters of life. We're glad that she is a somewhat speaker today to share her experience working in forensic medicine, walking in a woman's shoes. Madam, we are happy to welcome you to our midst. And I have no doubt that your experience will not only inform us about what is happening around the world in forensic medicine, and also will be a pile, you know, help a lot of people, especially women, to take up forensic medicine and related specialties as their career choices. Over to you, ma'am, and welcome again. Thank you very much, sir. Can I start, sir, with that? I would, with a wonderful introduction, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Roy Joseph, sir, uh, and also to Dr. Ishwar. And I thank Dr. Mala for uh, reaching out to me to be a speaker. Initially, I was quite anxious because I said I haven't so much contribution to talk about 30, 40 minutes, but I thought maybe, yes, there's something unusual that when I chose forensic, I had a lot of criticism from a lot of people close, near, dear, far ones. So I thought I can bring that into my experience of talking about how I felt. So good evening, one and all. 
So I have just a small disclaimer. I have no conflict of interest. The views expressed are my very own and do not reflect that of the employer. The instances quoted are incidents personal as well as those expressed to me in the capacity of sharing the anguish and the context does not refer to my current workplace at all. But a broader canvas of my earlier works, whichever I have conducted over a period of more than 25 years, which gave little or no space for discussion on gender inequality. So I have no complaints, but I can only say that that served as a stepping stone that how when we plan out things, how should we do, how should we care and how should have equality in our practice? So what is it to be like in a man's world to be a woman? It was a defining moment in my life when I got postgraduate admission in forensic medicine. I loved the subject. In fact, I was told even in my exam that I would get a gold medal, I had answered so well. Of course, I did not get the medal, but I was happy I did well in forensic. And I literally uh, agreed with the subject, but not the way it was described and about in females. So I thought I could make a difference. I can easily do anything with love. And also I have this particular attribute. If fate hands me a lemon, then I make a best lemonade and I don't cry out for orange juice yet. When I entered forensic department, things were not as I expected. I went literally bubbly, cheerful into the department and I was asked, do you think forensic is as easy as cooking? If it was, so many ladies would have taken it before you. Do you think you're more capable of others that you can handle forensic? So my main question is why does anything that a woman does and anything and everything have to do with cooking. And I would like to ask this, is cooking so easy? Making 20 rotis, two vegetables, rice, dal, chutney in an hour's time and getting tiffin packed and sent, is it so easy? So why would one think that what the other one does is an easy task and forensic is a mighty difficult task? Now, another thing that happened when I went into the department that my gender role as a female was taken very seriously. I encouraged it in the beginning because I started the tea club. In order to save time, I said, we all need to contribute 30 rupees a month. I would bring milk, I would boil milk, I would make tea, and then everybody would sit so that there would be goodwill. Instead of backbiting when two people go out and have tea and talk about another, because I knew that I couldn't go with them so I would be singled out. So instead of going, I started this, but it went to such an extent that one day, even when I asked for leave, I was told who will make the tea. So that is when they start thinking that your role goes beyond postgraduate and you have to be making tea. And then also when somebody got their child and wanted the wife to be examined, the child was given to me that look after the baby for some time, you know, and similarly, when the wives were to be entertained, when the husband's came for consultation with other people in the department. So it was more like I was a kind of a welcome services where telling people, please sit, please be comfortable. And also in confidences, I noticed it was not just my department. Now we have a bigger landscape where there are many forensic people, but my presence was appreciated because I could garland the chief guest or I could give a flower. So I was thinking, when will I be counted as a professional? And but for any mistake that I committed, the one thing I got to hear, being a girl, you should not be doing this. As though it's important that boys can do anything and get away with it, but not girls. So when I was very hurt, I did tell some of my friends who went and told this, and I was told that all this was being done to make me feel comfortable because I was capable of doing only this. So at least let her get satisfaction that she has done something. And if she doesn't like, she may leave. So then did I leave? And why did I not leave? I think it's getting stuck, yeah. Because I decided it was my life goal because I loved the subject, but I was told to make easy adjustments and be in my cozy field of not entering forensic. You do whatever you continue to do. But I still chose 
to face forensic because in fact in fact even my parents endorse this decision don't take forensic if it is so tough if they are against you from the day one how are you going to finish how are you going to survive how are you going to work there but i like to make my own judgment and if i love something i will do anything to get it and this i was i wanted to be a forensic person and when I get something, I will put all my commitment to see that it sustains. But what really, really helped me was a good counsel, a good mentor, my life partner, who I met during this journey just before this, and I got married. Had it not been for his support, probably, I don't know how I would have handled it. So that is how I took a decision to be in forensic. It was a road not taken, but there was no backtracking on my decision. I'm happy as I did, because in the words of Robert Frost, I shall be telling this with sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. And I agree with Robert Frost. How do we keep professional trajectories in a place that has a great animosity against you. I think we begin by working harder, by proving our mettle, by standing our ground. And most of all, very early in my postgraduate life, I learned the art of communication. It is not the cake, it is not the cream, it is not the flour or the sugar, it is a pinch of baking powder that makes cake a cake. And in that communication with that missing, you can't make a cake. So I tried not to fight. I tried not to get into a legal hassle with anybody. And I enjoyed learning. Like I said, I've, I had a good mentor. I found some friends. They became great allies. But it's also important to watch our own ego. Because sometimes you need to press your ego to such an extent that if egos are not there, then there is no inequality. You don't take an insult as an insult because you don't have an ego. So who decides what is good for you? And especially, why do girls have so many advisors? It's not only parents and the boss, including the neighbors, the friends, and people who you should be pleasing, who are important in your life. And in some places, even the panchayat and the other people who play a role that what a girl should do, who she should marry, and what religion she should follow, and what she should eat. But I would say, hear all advice, listen to good advice, but only heed wise counsel. We should have a difference to differentiate a husk from chef. chef. So that is our power of distinction. And because everybody has an advice for a lady because of our society, which is so patriarchal and totally we have gender stereotypes. It's a generalized view or a preconception about attributes that are characteristic or ought to be possessed by me and what roles I should be playing and how I should perform it. So I'm open for judgment all the time. Anybody can pass a judgment on me. So, but that limits the motivation the career options and aspirations for a girl to reach higher in life. Somebody else in my place, without the support as I got from my life partner, would have decided, okay, if this is so troublesome, I don't want to take all the trouble. But we should stand our ground. The institutional support backing the gender equality is very, very crucial. In 1994 to at least 2004, or for a long time, this wasn't there. Even you couldn't ask for it. Because in fact, the I started with a disadvantage. I started with a disadvantage knowing fully well that I was told to walk out. It is not meant for me, yet I wanted to be there. It was like, you are not wanted, but we can tolerate you anyway. So every institution must have a policy backing gender equality unless the institution takes a strong view and supports equality policy there will be arbitrary rules for promotion progress and recognition preconceived inability of ladies 
to do the task efficiently due to menstruation, pregnancy, delivery, child rearing, they could be imaginative barriers that a lady can't do it because of these. In fact, my colleagues have called up to tell me we have a forensic vacancy, but not for ladies. Why? So if institution provides support, for instance, my university right now has a crash. It's not only for working ladies perspective, but from the family perspective. It overall, it brings so much of happiness relaxes because the child is under the same roof. But many of the institutions don't have that. In my working earlier workplace, we had to literally move heaven and earth, go to one place, drop the kid, go to another place, drop and drop another kid, and then come back to work. And then if it is raining, you're stuck in rain, your two wheeler goes into the mud, and then you have to push it. And then there's always a mud and it's difficult to maneuver a two wheeler. So it's important to have that kind of institutional support. If I look back and say, why are so few women in STEM it is not with the women, it is with the society, with the gender stereotypes that STEM, the science, technology, engineering, mathematics, mechanical, everything is to do is masculine in nature. And parents think the girl is not capable of doing this. Male dominated cultures feel that this is all men's work. Women are good at child rearing. They can do any art, they can do painting and so on. I'm not saying that is secondary. Art is something so beautiful, so great, but not everybody can be an artist. Everybody has an inherent liking to be something. They should be allowed to be that. And there are fewer role models. I think the girls don't search out for good role models and they say, OK, this is my role model and I'm going to take inspiration from this person. I studied from Kiturani Chanama Public School and the fact that the lady Kiturani fought against Britishers initially single-handedly, later on, even when betrayed by her husband, and she still went right into the battlefield. So that always gave me a huge stimulus to not look at the outcome, but look at the process where one has to go steadfastly. And also math anxiety. This is a societal role in general that teachers who are predominantly women often have math anxiety, and they pass it on to girls. In fact, I was also told by my maths teacher that you're not good, you better leave it. You can take science, but not take maths. So this kind of uh, discouraging attitude uh, makes people not to go for these fields. How do you cope with who are you? What's your name again? It's a kind of things I faced very often in a lot of conferences as a postgraduate, as I was presenting, but repeatedly my introductions were being asked and my name was misspelled so that we should understand it is to bring an anxiety to make us feel you are not like our league. But I think we should think of your dignity is in your hands. It is not in anybody's hands. Nobody can take away your dignity without your permission. So that is how you can stand your ground with confidence, even though you're told that you're in a wrong place at a wrong time in a wrong subject, you're caught up with putrefied bodies, which you cannot make out, you can do nothing about it, but you still stand the ground because you think you can be honest. You can be a person with integrity. You can do your best. You can say, I don't know when you don't know. So these are the attributes. What we have, we need to pursue with them. If you have work, then stay focused and work hard. Let not microaggression, aggression deter you. But I would always give a huge marks for being diplomatic because boys can be abusive and get away with it. But a girl calling boys a name unnecessarily brings a lot of bad name to her and she has to rule in silence and nobody supports her. So diplomacy is a gift. So even when you're a lady, your professional judgment is taken with a pinch of salt. I now go to give evidence in court when I become an assistant professor. And there I'm made to ask again and again, what is your cause of death? I say head injury. And there was also chronic alcohol intoxication that uh, accelerated the death. What nonsense. You mean to say alcohol causes death? In that case, half India would have been wiped out by now. And to that, everybody say, ha, 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 in the court. So then you have just about a minute to respond. 
you do not have to refer you can't find out what to do all i could do was to ask for some water gulp the water and think fast how do i respond and i responded by saying you were right but that was years back but today there is a new scientific evidence to prove that death does happen in a case of chronic alcoholic person with even a minimal head injury and i have reference for that but this should happen fast and it happens if you don't lose your cool and i've seen a lot of our people in the court being treated like they are the convicts and not the experts who are giving evidence and especially if you're a lady everything is made ask how many have you done how much is your experience are you even married can you even examine such a case and so on so impact of gender stereotypes impacts us and but we know we, we don't relate the entire family does not relate that we have in some way played role in it because they lower the self esteem of a girl if she has set an ambition and you say no 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 that's not good for you forget about it then she does not aim higher in life every household should re reflect and introspect what messages are being conveyed to son and is there a different message to the daughter and if you tell a daughter you are only good at this you do this instead of that you should be telling her aim for the sky reach for the stars do your best in whatever you want to do but we have our blessings to you because i was very very enamored by valentina tereshkova she was born even before i was born i uh, she had made a solo mission to space single handed so she was for 72 hours in the orbit in vostok so i would think a cosmonaut in 1963 could oppose the stereotypes and come out and be the first woman we still doubt our daughters to take a shuttle bus leave alone a shuttle to space we worry is she safe so what confidence are we giving to our child what is it that we are telling her we are safe you are safe society i'm going to look after you don't worry but no we don't on the contrary we make them feel unsafe a woman carries her clothes but it's the shoes that carries a woman so to be happy it first takes being comfortable being in your own shoes so i had to learn to be comfortable although others thought i was not comfortable i was in misfit but i had to feel the comfort myself roles of teachers parents and society can't be underestimated by learned behavior child picks up and believes that math science engineering technology are for only boys girl doesn't have a talent by condition believing girls will not put their efforts it results into a see do get phenomena i think i'm bad in maths i don't have i stop working hard because i don't work hard i get a less marks then i believe in my teacher see she had already told me that's how i should not be doing this it is not crying but listening standing longer and stronger and nurturing our aspirations with that of our colleagues it's a very important aspect of making a statement it's not easy to challenge stereotypes but society doesn't change if you don't start changing yourself first and i would say the main role is within the family first to change parents teachers society we all have duty now this is another evergreen hero of mine i can never ever say how much i was inspired by her nancy grace logan the first lady scientist in nasa so she says that i still remember asking my teacher to take a second year algebra instead of fifth year latin but her teacher looked down her nose and sneered what lady would take mathematics instead of latin so nancy grace logan went on to become the mother of hubble telescope and even today we remember her for her contribution as an astronomer she became the nasa's first chief astronomer so we already have a lot of barriers of stereotypes broken but yet it's not that uh, it's making much difference because still when we think of an astronomer we think of man we think of a telescope we relate it to a man we think of an orbit in the galaxy we think of a man so i would say cinderella is a proof that a pair of shoes can change your life so it is the shoes that you wear with conviction and the walk that you do with conviction that helps you be successful in your career because from the beginning of the career if i trace the trajectory it has been quite tolerable because of the system of 
societal mentoring that happens. So we all need to look at a mentor. Maybe within the family, like I have my life partner, Dr. Ravi Vaswani, like within our friend circle or within the society, but it is their advice we must heed, and not everybody's because we have a great aspiration to please everybody, but it is not going to happen. It's like going for a wedding and people have spent lakhs of rupees and then we still have names to keep because at that moment, the akshata that was handed was not read enough. So we have reasons to be unhappy. So we can't be people pleasers, but we should know what we should do so that we are able to have a strong um, emotions attached to our profession and have rationality into our profession. So it's a good mix of emotional, rational, spiritual, intellectual pursuit we all should be doing. So with that, I think I have finished four minutes before. I was half afraid I will exceed my time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very passionate and thought-provoking talk. It was very interesting to hear the extraordinary challenges you faced in your career path. You talked about the importance of having a good mentor and a fighting ego of the people. I think you have given a very good advice to the listeners. Heed wise counsel. I like that. I think <laughs> uh, the session is open for a discussion. I invite uh, 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 people to ask uh, questions and uh, cl get clarifications. Thank you. Okay. Rina, I'd like to st set the ball rolling because many of these experiences are shared by women, you know, but as you said in the beginning, it's very, very difficult to stand our ground. Yes. Because, you know, women generally don't stand their ground. Yes. And you said we have to also be diplomatic and we should have communication skills. But oftentimes in India, you know, the language for a woman to stand her ground, you know, it's not easy to come by. Because even the act of saying no, by a woman is seen as rude. So how do we say a clear, loud no or a clear standing up for our what we are in contexts which don't lend themselves to even a simple no, I don't want to make tea. Go and make it yourself. Yeah. It's a very, very wonderful question and it still has me thinking, how did I respond then? How did I come out of it? And I also acknowledge the fact that it's difficult to stand ground because sometimes you feel the moment you say no, you are perceived as arrogant. And the price of arrogance for a lady she has to pay is much more than maybe, I feel, because I'm, I can only speak on behalf of ladies because I have lived experience of a lady. Uh, because when I was passed on for promotion more than seven to eight years being a lecturer, I didn't get a promotion. We were told that you have to have publication, I had publication. We were to, told to attend conferences, I had attended international conference with the child in the hand, breastfeeding the child. But then I didn't get promotion because I was arrogant. But the arrogance was what? Because I said no. And no for what? No for something that was not my value system. So then I decided I had to choose. Would I like to give in and start doing things that I don't wish to do? Or would I say it's okay if I don't get a promotion? I'll still live here. So the, then the, I, had to, I had a choice between making adjustments, not in the value system, but in the external values. Okay, I don't go higher up in the ladder. So that's okay. But at the same time, how do we, we still stick our ground. We stay a bit longer. We many times realize that the, what you see as a bend is not the end of the road, but we perceive it as an end and give up easily because things change. So automatically now, if you look at forensic, I feel so proud to be belonging because the younger generation is very steadfast. It's so committed. 
In fact, last year I even got the, I could never even think 10 years back, I got the Lifetime Achievement Award by JSS from the Kannadak Medical Legal Society because they are so fine-tuned now to looking at what are the different dimensions and what is the hard work like. So, but we have to stand the ground in the simple sense that it's against your value system, don't do it. If there are small changes in the diplomatic way or external appearances that you have to give that he's good, yes, you say he's good, it's fine. But that is where I say diplomacy, but our values are not to be compromised. I wouldn't do that. I don't know if I've answered your question or part answered your question, but that is only that I have to answer. Our questions are invited from Neelam audience. Neelam. Oh, so, sorry, doctor. We had lo lost the connection for some time. Um, yeah, is uh, it? Can you hear me? Yeah, now loud and clear again. Okay, uh, Neelam Putran has raised her hand, I think. Yeah, please I go ahead. Neelam? I didn't mean to raise my hand for any question except to tell you that you are an amazing person. I have personal experience and uh, while I am, of course, a couple of decades older than you, I think you're a great leader, a great role model. And thank you because you allowed me to do a PG diploma at the age of 68 and I am still thrilled about it. Thank you for my confidence and thank you for everything. All the best. Thank you, Neelam. I should say at the age of 68, if you did PG diploma, we are privileged to have you as a student because a student <laughs> teaches teachers as much as a teacher teaches a student. It's always an interaction. And we have been enriched in 12 years of our experience. We have become enriched only by the student's diverse experience. So it was nice that you chose us to do your PG diploma with Nidam. Thank you. Thank you. We have a, yeah, we have a question from Adrija Roy. Uh, Dr. Vaswani, it was wonderful listening to you. Unfortunately, there were instances where Women can inadvertently demotivate or undermine each other in professional settings. Did you ever have to face something like that? In your experience, what strategies can be employed to address this issue and promote a more supportive culture among women, particularly in traditionally male-dominated fields? Thank you very much because that is one of the core issues. I did say that we need to nurture and not only our aspirations, but that of others. Because it's like the mother-in-law, daughter-in-law syndrome. Because when a new daughter-in-law comes in, the mother-in-law says, I went through a lot of problem, you know. So yet I became a good person. So let me give my daughter-in-law a tough time. So it's somewhere in the name of that, trying to make a person better, we continue to heap injustice and inequality. So I think if we see one, we should confront them and we should say, this is how it appears to me. And we should not be doing it. In fact, I had such a model, actually, I can't say role model, a negative role model, and I chose not to be like her. When my wedding was declared for two days, they were there to go. She did not allow me the leave. She said, no, so many people are getting married. So many children are born. Do we really need so many children in society? Do we need marriages for that matter? She was not married all right. And she was so against the whole idea of marriage. So I had to either leave my job and go, <laughs> or I have to go and come back and face the flag. But I decided leaving is not my forte. I don't cow down and leave. I would rather take a good fight on me. So I went for uh, uh, my wedding leave without her permission, came back and faced a lot of flag. But you know what? We always have to stand our ground. We don't have to cow down and cry and feel bad. If it is unjustly done, look at it and say it is injustice. It's not against me. It is her system of dealing with justice. Don't personalize it. Many a times we personalize and we give in and we stop the fight altogether. And that is where we stop being role models to somebody. And at this point, uh, we had gone for a conference in Mysore and one of my bosses said, we are going to boycott the conference and come out because this conference is not good. I was pregnant eight months and I have a small child who came to see my presentation. And what do I tell them? that my boss says, don't attend presentation. We are going to boycott. Reason? No reason. I was not given due regard in the welcome speech or whatever. This is more of an ego problem. I decided I might oppose him, but it's going to be hell for me. But I decided, what will I tell my daughter? Why I'm not presenting? 
She did not even go for sightseeing. Mama, your presentation, sexing of the human sternum, I would like to listen to it. She wouldn't understand anything beyond it, but she wanted to. So then I decided, no, I will go. I will present. I will take what it takes. So once we stand the ground, they cannot fault you on those issues. He can't make a written complaint against me, although he wanted to. But what could he say? I got the best paper award. Again, the same JSS Mysore. So then we try to say that we can't give in the fight. You see how it is, and you see you have doing the right thing. They may have a complaint against you, but it is not a wrong thing you're doing. And let it be, you cannot please him. I decided one thing in life. I can never ever stand to his expectation because I didn't leave the job. Maybe if I'd left that time and gone, he would have even once called me for tea, coffee and told everybody she's a very nice person. But the moment I was like a thorn in the department, I, I was like a thorn that they couldn't get away and uh, throw me away. So that is why we need to understand, uh, like you said, but we need to have a nurturing relationship. We should have a mentors who can take our uh, anxiety to some extent and give us good advice. We can cultivate such friendships. I can I add yeah, something? Yeah, Veena, Mala wants to add something. I can yeah, sure. Add because there are, this question applies to many of us in those mentoring roles. One thing really helps in those contexts. Sometimes our allies are not within our institutions. Our allies usually are phone calls away. And it really helps to make a phone call and talk to someone because, you know, momentary displeasure, momentary anger goes away. Catharsis. Yeah. And you start to laugh even at yourself and the, what shall I say, the small mindedness of some people. And when you learn to laugh, it goes away. Excellent. And then you gain the courage and the strength to stand your ground. Does it help? It, it really, absolutely, I agree to that. And I should also say this, that I have called Mala at times. I've called at times to just unburden myself. I believe in the power of catharsis. When I feel that things are going just southward, then there's one person I can talk who is non-judgmental. So you should look for people who listen to you. Many a times you may not even need guidance, go right, go left, do this, do that. But when you're speaking, you become more articulate. And there is also huge power in sharing your anguish and writing it down. I have a journal, I write down. That's how I'm able to re, I mean, uh, recollect a lot of these stuff. Because when I write and I look back and I write my hurts, then I feel that was a bit disproportionate. I think I overreacted. But today, if the same thing was to happen to me, I wouldn't feel that way. Because I would say the person is being very moody. The person is being unrealistic. The person is not understood me, but kind of, having their own mental uh, uh, impressions because of the surroundings and not with me. So I'm very clear because I write journals and my feelings and I don't see any pattern emerging from there. So it's important for us to make a journal and to reflect upon it quite often. And I think whatever feeling it is, it's normal to feel that way, but by writing it down, we feel much lighter. Well said, ma'am. Hello, madam. Yeah, okay, fine. This is a question from me. This is has a personal aspect to it. This comes as a this question comes as a father of a child who is 15 year old and she have and the child is a it's a girl child. Many a times, you know, as a father, you know, I have uh, been found it difficult to to draw the line between protectionism for the child, girl child, and letting her go. The many instances when you know we have these differences because you know as a father you know i'm always concerned about her safety whereas she is a bird waiting to fly out there yeah. uh, oblivious of all the dangers that are lurking out there how do you think a father or a parent can draw a line between holding fast and letting go when you raise a girl child Absolutely. I would say it's not only when you raise a girl child, when you raise any child, be it a boy or a girl or even transgender for that matter. My whole idea would be that what is the common currency between the child and me? And that common currency ought to be trust. 
that if the trust is the only currency, then she wants it, she's telling it to you. You stop her, she will not tell you next time. Or she wants it so badly, she will do it without your knowledge. She could be more in danger. But if you leave a communication open as a bridge and she tells you and you say, this is my problem, and then she would say, no, such things won't happen, then you will say, I'm the first person you should talk to if something goes wrong. Otherwise, I will not be allowing you the next time. But once slowly you build the confidence, you realize that our children really stand and they don't uh, uh, miss uh, trust us. Because I, I do remember a time when my daughter was uh, finishing her third standard. She was nine, uh, nine years and she wanted to go to Bombay. She promised my in-laws that she'll be going and she's a very much um, well-loved kid in the family. So they wanted her, but we had a MCI, we could not go. So nine-year-old kid, we left her alone in a bus to go to Bombay. And how many of us would do that? But after that, when she was 20, she went alone to Germany for her internship. She looked for a room. She looked for everything because I knew then that if she can go at nine years, she can certainly go anywhere in the world at any age. So we just need to be careful. You tell the driver, you tell some people, you trust someone, you then give them the confidence. And once she has the confidence, by age of 11, she was even taking a brother who was three or four. So it is how much confidence you breathe into them that they rise to the occasion. But if I were to say world is bad, you can't do. But then the question is not everyone is bad. Just the other day at the air airport, I saw a sweet girl, I said, hi. She said, I don't talk to strangers. I felt bad. What kind of a society are we doing here? <laughs> what kind of a society is this? Is this girl made to believe every stranger is out to do some harm to you? Is this even a beautiful world for a girl? So I think we should lose that this thing. But if you want, we should be there for them. To tell them I'm there, I'll pick you, I'll drop you, I will do it. But cultivating friendship is more important than keeping them safe. The other thing that helps in certain contexts is to genuinely keep those doors of conversation open. Yeah. Um, I was traveling for a very long time in by air with a male child. And I was terrified of letting him into the men's loo, but he was not at the age when I could take him to the ladies' loo. So I sat down before the travel and gave a lecture on good touch, bad touch to a four and a half, five year old in order to ensure that he would be safe and stood outside the men's loo and prayed. But it helps. Yeah. yeah. And inch by inch, they gain their confidence. And once they have confidence, they move with confidence. Then you can tell them, this is what you should do. This is what. So it is, it's been, we have a huge role in making them feel confident also about themselves and about people around them. That's very helpful, Mala, what you said. It really counts, yeah. Thank you, Madam. I, uh, if there are, are there any more questions from the audience? This is from you. No, someone uh, there's one comment in the chat box that was a great talk and all of us who have struggled through the system have faced these problems in some form your achievements today gives us a lot of courage not only for ourselves but as mothers in bringing up independence self-reliant daughters thank you once again this is from maya thank you maya thank you <laughs> okay i think all good things have to end at can i ask my question yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Who is that? Roshni Babu. Please shoot. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Veena, uh, you know, I've been your student and I've seen how supportive you've been of uh, um, gender equality, et cetera, in our courses, et cetera. I would like to know that since you have gone through what was uh, what you explained in your lecture, and now that you're in a position that you are directing an international program, you are the head of the department, you are a part of the board of International Association for Bioethics, etc. What are the measures that you have taken that um, are inclusive 
when it comes to uh, women uh, in every aspect of your program, of your institute, of your students, etc., so that it can inspire um, all of us who are attending this lecture to do the same uh, wherever we are. First of all, whoever has shown an interest in the subject of studying, we have never denied them. Sometimes they were not qualified even, but we have brought them to that level of training by con uh, constant, even including the language skills we have given, because we see that there is a hope that they could go ahead. And because somebody is deprived of language skill or something and being females, they should not be doubly burdened that, okay, they cannot be a part of this. So we have tried to open our doors to that extent possible that they will walk with the interest and we match their interest with our uh, motivation for them to keep on. Thank you very much. Thanks again. And if there are no more questions, are there any more questions? Good that you finished the talk a little earlier so that more people could ask questions on this one. Uh, if there are no more questions, I invite Dr. Mala Ramanathan to propose the I vote. A question by Dr. I think R.P. Verma has shown his uh, hand. Ravi Prasad Verma. Yeah. So there is. Yeah. Uh, uh... If you per if there's time, I'll just yeah sure go ahead go ahead go ahead yeah 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 I didn't want to uh, take the opportunity away from others who may have uh, some queries to ask. I think uh, madam that was a very um, um, uh, what do you say wonderful talk in that uh, many of these challenges are faced by anybody who uh, doesn't follow the stereotype. So if a man also has a caring role, then all the challenges faced are very, very, um, you know, I mean, the uh, there's a lot of similarity in the challenges that uh, one has to face. When I'm traveling with my kid, the uh, diaper changing uh, table is always inside the woman's loo. And when I travel with my daughter, when I'm alone with my daughter and she's eight years old and she needs to go to the loo, I think I share the experience which uh, Professor Mala was talking about trusting and praying and standing outside the loo till she comes back. Um, but I think what is a bit perplexing for me is uh, probably because of my personal thing. I know many women of uh, an older generation who used to travel in general compartments, um, you know, across the state and probably partly poverty might have been the reason you needed to have a job to survive. And so you find whichever job you get, you go there and do that job. But now I find that uh, for many uh, young persons, if it's the next district, uh, people are anxious to send them there. If we look at the course, I think the first generation uh, challenges are overcome. Many of the courses, including engineering uh, admissions, it's open to a lot of women. Even in mechanical engineering, sometimes women outnumber the men. But when it comes to a job, even if it's in the next district, you know, then it's like uh, I know many persons who were not sent to the next district because they can come back only on weekends kind of thing. So uh, how to, you know, uh, advise students, people are asking for placements, what job should I do after my master's? Uh, how do we as teachers uh, advise students in such a situation? I think whenever there, is a, whenever there is a context, they have to face it. Some amount of adjustments have to be done. So when the adjustments are done, if the adjustments are such that they do not much disturb the family life, if she has to travel only on the weekend, but if she can still take the child with someone who helps her with babysitting till the child goes to school, because much of these teething problems are only till the child goes to school. But then we look at it like such a big thing that we let the job go by and then it's sometimes be, be difficult for them to get back into the job. And I do agree it's the first generation had a different problem because my mom was a first generation of office goer. At the age of 18, she started taking job. And that was way back, I think in 52, 53 people used to open windows and look at her and she always had to look down and walk. She wouldn't look up because she would be looked at very arrogant. But then they had a societal society to please. But in our generation, at least we don't have to please society. We do things what we think is right. But still in certain rural areas, that compulsion is still there that they have to follow the norms. 
But I think whoever is taking a new job, if they take it as a challenge, because every growth brings in pain, no growth is painless. So what part of pain would you like to go through and keep it and continue to grow? And what of pain you don't want it? It's for us. And again, like I said, if you have somebody, you can confide and decide whether you'd like to give a try. But I would always think without giving a try, giving up the, this thing is not right. Dr. Varma, can I add something? Am I audible? Dr. Varma, uh, are you there? Yeah. Dr. Maya wants to say something. So one thing really helps. One is institutional mechanisms that are supportive of women, meaning if women have to travel long distances, lo many of our buses are supportive in the sense we have women's seats. But if we have to go to another place, then we can help a little as teachers by telling the parents, by networking with, you know, making that extra effort for women students to go and work in neighboring district or faraway districts by saying that there are working women's hostels, keeping available a list of working women's hostels where they can stay, um, finding, you know, uh, allies to network with in the place uh, and telling the parents how frequently they can visit or any of those things, or even telling the parents that rather than giving up the job, you can be a better supportive person by actually going and helping to get her settled in, in a place that you also trust, rather than giving up. But, you know, we have to go out on a limb for our women students when compared to male students, because the societal structures don't facilitate women's employment as much as they do. And you have to remember, the census tells us from 1960s to now, female labor force participation has actually declined. So, you know, we are also looking at the consequences of that. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Mala. Uh, I think we need to wind up the proceedings uh, as we are close to 6 p.m. Uh, that was a wonderful uh, uh, lecture and followed by some extremely good discussion um, as we grapple uh, the gender related issue in our institution also and as parents and brothers husbands etc cetera, etc cetera. now i would like to invite dr mala ramanathan to propose the vote of thanks thank you dr ishwar the summer lecture series owes its existence to the zeal of the director of sri chitra Tirunal institute of medical sciences and technology professor sanjay bihari who urged us to start this inspiring series to showcase the world to Sri Chitra and Sri Chitra to the world. The director's office with Ms. Sri Priya was always on hand to solve the simplest to the complex of administrative issues to ensure the smooth conduct of this web series. But the best wishes need infrastructure and connectivity to in ensure that wishes become reality. The computer division of Sri Chitra under Mr. Suresh Kumar and Ms. Geeta are always ready to facilitate these initiatives. Their commitment is what enables us to conduct the web series without too many glitches. The Dean, Dr. Joseph, took charge recently and was always reassuring about his commitment to his role as the academic chief of the institution, leading our academic initiatives, big and small, from the front. Thank you, sir, for coming forward to preside over the Sambad series and initiating the discussions for today's talk. For every one of the web series, Professor Ishwar, the chairperson of, uh, of Sri Chitra's PRO committee and head of the Department of Neurosurgery has taken on the role of the MC, bringing to the role his customary cheer and wit. The series would not be what it is without his contributions. Today, we have Dr. Veena Vaswani, who brought her life experiences to us with an honesty and warmth for all of us to learn from. Madam, I'm very grateful to you for consenting to give the Samad lecture at such short notice and sharing your experiences that are truly an inspiration to all young researchers, particularly women in STEM. I'm also grateful to the audience who on this auspicious day of the Hindu calendar of Dham Namni made an effort to log in and listen to this lecture. We actually gain strength from all of you. The next talk in the Samad lecture series will be after the Easter break. 
Our speaker will be Dr. Amalo Pavanathan, the eminent vascular surgeon and member of the State Planning Board of Tamil Nadu and the architect of Tamil Nadu's ambitious organ transplant program. I look forward to welcoming you all once again to the next lecture, which will be announced soon on our website. Thank you very much and Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam. Thank you for the thank opportunity. For joining us and thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Same.